Okay, we are going to get started in 30 seconds. I want to request our audience to just use the chat window and tell us where you are coming from, which part of the world. And if you want to share, you can also tell us uh, what you do. Uh, we are happy to uh, interact with you as we go along. And uh, we have almost 25 people in the room, so we are good to start. Uh, our topic is very interesting today. It's Web3 Investment Trends. And we'll be talking to you for about 60 minutes. My name is Sharad Agarwal. Um, I'm the Chief Metaverse Officer of Cybergear. We are a digital Web3 agency, uh, pivoted last year. So I'm basically a Web1 guy. I've been in digital space for like 27 years, right from the time we used to use dial-up modems to connect to the internet. Um, so yeah, we are here to have some fun, learn from each other's experiences, and uh, it's totally an organic discussion. I promise you nothing is scripted. We never had a practice session. We'll be happy to take questions from the audience uh, through the chat window, and let's get started. I'm going to go to Sophia first for her introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this panel with the other distinguished panelists. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Sophia Schluger. Um, I'm the former managing director uh, for EMEA for Amber Group, one of the um, fintech unicorns and crypto market makers. Um, and I'm currently a venture partner at Vintner Capital, um, which is an investor community of 30,000 uh, professionals who come together to co-invest, source deals, syndicate different opportunities, and also sponsor events to continue to grow um, our ecosystem within Web3, crypto, and blockchain. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Chana, uh, who lives in UK, but presently is in NFT Paris. Chana, what's, what's this talk? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hello. Please introduce yourself. Hi, bonjour, I should say. Um, my name is Chana Kanzen. I am a, a former partner in Digital Wealth Fund, which is a DeFi fund, um, consulting with Anamoka Brands on an educational blockchain solution. And I am head of partnerships for Rug Radio, which is a fully decentralized Web3 media company. Um, so that's me. Great. Uh, Hassan? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's great to be part of the other panelists as well. Um, I work at Crow, a financial advisory firm, as a senior vice president. I'm also a senior advisor at a few accelerators. Uh, one of them is Hub71, where I support and mentor startups as well as sitting on the selection committee. I also do a similar role with Outlier Ventures. I'm sure you've all heard of it, as well as a Startup Bootcamp. Great. I'm going to bounce to Roberto. I think you are in Riyadh today, Roberto. Hello, hello everyone. No, I'm back. I'm back to Dubai. Um, okay. There is a funding day, banking, bank holiday in in Saudi these days. Um, um, thank you, Sharad, for for inviting me. Uh, nice meeting uh, you, everyone. Um, my name is Roberto. I've been a former managing director at Microsoft for startups across Middle East and Africa for uh, venture capital and, and startup ecosystem. So uh, I've been working with, with uh, a number of uh, startups and ecosystem players uh, uh, around new startups and technologies, uh, and, and of course, including blockchain. Uh, and I recently took a new role in Saudi uh, for uh, a public investment fund, um, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund in Saudi Arabia, uh, as a director of value creation and, and uh, synergies across portfolio companies. Um, and I'm also founder on the side of Constructive Rebels. So it's a company we, we help organizations uh, uh, to, to with, with change management and uh, uh, organizational transformation. Thank you, Roberto. And we are also colleagues in a fund we don't want to talk about today, but yeah, I know Roberto pretty well. Let's go to Charlie. Wonderful. Uh, hey, everybody. Lovely to be a, a part of the panel and sharing a discussion with, with you all today. Um, I, uh, about eight years ago, co-founded and scaled what became one of the leading digital innovation studios in the UK. It's called Peach Studios, uh, predominantly working around immersive technology with the likes of Warner Brothers, Lego, Selfridges, uh, and most recently uh, in the investment side of the board, where I'm the founder and managing director of the Peach Collective, which is a global investment network that specializes in off-market deal flow. Uh, we're really hot on everything from AI to immersive tech uh, and then touching on a little crypto as well. 
Amazing. Uh, so thank you for those introductions. We have an amazing panel. I think our audience will agree with that. So uh, let's set the stage. Sophia, can you define for us Web3, what it's all about and why, why it's a big deal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, Web3 is a natural progression from what we've seen with Web1, which was read-only internet, to Web2, which is read and write internet, to Web3, which is what I like to think read, write, and own. And what's amazing about it is that it is blockchain-based, token-based, and presents new socioeconomic models for e-commerce as well as engagement. So if you think about it, it's really the next generation of the internet, which is going to focus more on sort of machine-based understanding of data, which will provide a more data-driven and semantic or intelligent web. Um, I think What's really innovative here is the fact that dynamic applications will be able to interconnect in decentralized manner and provide for quicker and more personalized user experiences, including the ability to monetize your own data. So there's a lot of great things about it, and I'm hopefully I didn't overcomplicate the definition, but um, it's a really exciting way and a new evolution in the way the internet has been developed. Great. And uh, if I may pick on monetize your own data, own your own, own your data and monetize your data, I think is a big deal because in Web2, all the social media giants became billionaires and we, the people, made no money. We created all the content. We posted, we liked, we shared. The big boys didn't create any content, yet they became billionaires. So now in Web3, I see this as an opportunity where power is shifting from big brands to we the people, and this is our chance to monetize. Absolutely. Uh, so that's my take on Web3. Uh, anybody else uh, on the panel wants to add to the Web3 definition, your take on Web3? I, I, I'll go. I think that one very important aspect that hasn't been mentioned is, is uh, very much what you were saying, Sherrod, about enabling the community management. So Web3, is very much based around the community structure and the tribal nature of people feeling that they belong to a community and then enabling that uh, financial infrastructure to come from being an active member of that community. So the more you engage with the community, the more you can help grow that community as a whole and then almost profit off the shares um, as a result. So that decentralized nature is one of the, I think, the most powerful things, especially I, I work for a media company now, um, which is all based around community. And the idea of rewarding community members directly through loyalty schemes, in a sense, which is NFTs, um, is a game changer in terms of marketing and community engagement and getting directly to consumer. Uh, whereas in the past, the Web2 companies controlled that and they profited of that. The game changer of Web3 is that the consumers can directly be enabled and profit from uh, that technology. Yeah, 100% agree with you. And if I may just add a wee bit to that, uh, Web3 is not so much about technology, it's a mindset. And I'm reading the chat uh, window, Yaya says Web3 is freedom. I kind of agree with that because this is the creator economy. We have the freedom to co-create and create magic. So yeah, anybody else from the panel wants to add to the definition of Web3? What, what is your take on Web3? Yeah, Hassan. Yeah, look, I mean, um, I totally agree with uh, what Sophie and uh, Hannah have said. Um, what I would add to that is I get people saying it's going to be a virtual world, it's going to be augmented reality, it's a decentralized platform. For me, like I do take all of this on board, but my view is what is the next iteration of the internet? As Sophie said, we've had web one, we've had web two, we've had e-commerce, you know, around for some time now, we've had social media. What is next? You know, everybody now is looking for the next iteration of the internet, just like we had mobile phones, which evolved into camera phones. And then you had the next thing being wearables. I think within Web3, that's the thing. That's the big question. What is going to be next with the internet, with Web2? What's, what, how is that going to uh, transform our lives? So I think it's very exciting. You know, I can't wait to see what is next. We see a lot of concepts being de developed, uh, you know, from metaverses to NFTs to decentralization. But, you know, it's, it's yet to be seen what is going to be the winner 
that will take a lead within Web3. Yeah, so uh, just to take on what's next, I'm this afternoon I was at something called Gulf Food and we were discussing food and metaverse. And one of the panelists, uh, and again, I talk about him a lot. His name is Alistair Pernego from Milan. I think Roberto's uh, hometown. And he has developed something called metaverse of senses. So you can actually smell coffee in the metaverse. And the larger picture is he's not trying to sell burgers or, or perfumes or anything like that. He's looking at healthcare as the big picture because apparently every organ of our body emits a particular kind of smell. And using his tech, doctors can with 90% accuracy predict the state of our organs. So if you ask me what's next in tech, it's metaverse of senses as an example. And of course, there are going to be so many other rollouts, uh, only time will tell. But I'm going to bounce to Roberto with that same um, track. What's next, according to you, Roberto, in, in the Web3 space? Uh, thank you so much. And and first of all, uh, I agree with all points of views that have been shared so far. Uh, and and it's very inspiring conversation. And whenever we talk about food, I, I like to jump, <laughs> to jump in. And uh, I have my point of view on that. And still, uh, still, I, li I love food. Uh, so um, look, what's next? It's it's. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, 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 we touch base on a number of things, right? So Web3 is, is, it could be a bunch of different things. We, 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 we talked about uh, NFT, Metaverse, uh, Blockchain, a bunch of other things. Uh, we talked about the, what's next, what's the next version of the internet, which uh, of course it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting. And we didn't even mention uh, uh, ChatGPT uh, in, in this conversation so far and how that would, uh, would change the, the, the whole thing in terms of how data can be leveraged as well in terms of modeling and, and interactions with people. But that's also uh, something very interesting. To me, it boils down to two things. One is, uh, uh, one is uh, that, that we didn't touch base uh, on yet. One is, what are the, the, the main use cases? What are the real use cases where this makes sense, right? Because there, there might be situations where decentralization really uh, is, a, is, a, is a game changer or it's something that would enable different models that were not possible before. And you mentioned, for example, creator economy. I've been long time at Google, and I always um, um, question, uh, you know, uh, uh, how the, the the big percentage of the pie was not going to the source of uh, content, the value, the, the creation of of content, right? Which, which, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, uh, was not equally distributed for sure. And and for sure, uh, uh, Web three can uh, Web three technologies can can help. Uh, uh, you know, in, in that, and and that could be a use case where decentralization makes total sense. But there are still situations where um, uh, there is a trend where we are trying to apply decentralization to everything, and maybe it doesn't make sense to to apply to everything. The other thing that we didn't touch base on is also digital property, the concept of digital property in a decentralized world or in a world where these technologies are enabling more decentralization and, and new models. So uh, there there are situations and there are a number of uh, cases where uh, we probably need to spend more time in um, uh, assessing and uh, 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 having a deeper conversation in, in terms of digital property and digital ownership, right? So who is going to own the data or a specific uh, thing in, in, in this new world, right? So, uh, uh, and that's a sensitive conversation in, in many different use cases. So um, uh, I think, I think I mean, I'm all, always positive about new technologies. Um, I've seen it from the big tech angle and how uh, new technologies can impact the life of millions of, of millions of people, right? So I'm, I'm very positive about that. Just raising the fact that, uh, uh, as you said, probably it's not about the technology. It's, it's about, it's about uh, uh, you know, the appetite I see around Web3 goes way beyond the technology layer, which is there, probably has been there since already some time. But it's more about, uh, you know, uh, how people come together. Uh, how we as human beings uh, uh, give that human interface to technology and how we can provide more engaging and enriching uh, you know, experiences uh, for people to, uh, to come together and to do something together or to reinvent new business models. Yeah, before I go to Charlie, uh, essentially what Roberto was saying was that if tomorrow uh, LinkedIn decided to close shop, I would lose my 35,000 followers and Roberto would lose his 40,000 followers. And uh, that is what Web3 is supposed to be solving, right? So uh, Charlie, what's next? So I think one of the one of the things that is exciting 
affecting the most and is making me most curious is the way that AI is, is starting to shift our relationship with technology. So, you know, we're we're in a world right now experiencing the likes of Alexa, which is quite a passive relationship with, with robotics. Um, and I think it becomes a really interesting scenario when AI and robotics and the way that technology engages us and becomes more proactive. You know, what does that look like? What do we need for it to achieve for us, for us to accept a more proactive relationship with technology that is less driven by us, but more assisted by the, the technology that we're engaging with? So to me, that is really fascinating. Um, and I think it's it's where we see a next chapter of, of AI um, and the way it embeds into our lifestyle. Yeah, great. Uh, I didn't intend to talk too much about chat GPT or AI just as yet. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, from whatever I've been reading, uh, it's GPT 3.5, somewhere thereabouts, right? So it is working on some 175 billion parameters. And the next iteration is uh, of uh, GPT 4 is going to be based on 100 trillion parameters. It's going to be an exponential shift of what we see today are the capabilities of chat GPT and what they are going to be in tomorrow's world. It's kind of scary and kind of exciting. So I have two hands raised. I'll go to Sophia and then Chana. Yeah, thanks very much. I just wanted to make one other comment on Web3 and Metaverse because I think people are using the two terms interchangeably. So I view them as two different cutting edge technologies. So Web3, as we've just discussed, is the next generation of the internet. Um, meanwhile, Metaverse is a virtual world that operates on a decentralized blockchain network. So they both are decentralized systems, but you can imagine, you know, someone could create a Metaverse and do it in Web2 and call it that and then just proclaim it is. So just to be very clear that, yes, the idea is that Metaverses will be built within Web3, but that they're not one and the same thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is just to contextualize what we're discussing is thinking about how much funding has been going into Web3. So basically in 2022, which was you know, a bearish market, the Web3 landscape saw total funding of 7.1 billion. And that is a huge increase from the previous year where 4.8 billion came into the space. So despite the headwinds, there's a lot of brands, companies investing and building right now for the Web3 future because of all the promises that it will deliver, particularly to users and empowering them to monetize their data as we discussed. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, great insights, Chana. Um, follow, I have something else to say, but I'm gonna address what Sophie said in even more detail. Um, I actually think that Web3, it, it was actually, the term was actually invented, I think in 2016 by a professor. It's, a, it's an umbrella terminology for everything that's happening in the, in this sort of blockchain arena and i i actually really detest the word metaverse because the metaverse for me has two parallel lines you have metaverses actual virtual worlds that are being created at the moment most of them are in very early stages and not fully completely functional right now interoperability is absolutely crucial for these web metaverses to work um, if not, the sustainability angle and the profitability angle is going to decrease because people are going to have to shift from metaverse to metaverse. So until we get that sorted out, with, which is technically not available yet, we're too early really to really, so there's a lot of money going into the infrastructure of metaverse creation with the viewpoint that that is going to be the next um, stage, but we don't know. There hasn't really been any metaverse yet that's truly successfully navigating this, except, believe it or not, for Roblox, which is hugely successful and navigated mainly from kids between the age of sort of 11 and 18. So there we're seeing that generation is so comfortable in this space that I think as they grow, we're going to see a huge shift in terms of how this functions within the actual global economy. And that's why all this investment is going in to facilitate this. Um, in terms of the Web3, there's we're seeing lots of different verticals, all 
sort of linked together through the blockchain. And we're even seeing a shift in terms of, because I, I work very deeply in the NFT sector, and the word NFT is being changed into things like digital assets, right? Um, digital, um, you, you have digital art, you have digital music. We're seeing a migration from the word NFT, which is a scary word and ultimately is a line of code, um, to actually talking about what that represents um, from an investment perspective as well. So there is a shift in language that's being used, and I think that there has to be more clarity, and we're going to see that in terms of the language. In terms of the AI that's coming in, which is almost parallel, but very much holistically ingrained into everything that we're doing, um, there's so much, I think, that's happening experimentally between building in APIs with ChatGTP and seeing where that can take us that we don't even know what's going to evolve. But in but for the global economic and investment perspective, the fact that we have this technology in place is going to fundamentally ch uh, shift the incoming um, resource from skill set and jobs. So because of all uh, many, many jobs that kids are now preparing for will be redundant and even education as a the whole entire education system is going to change because homework is just not going to be needed anymore. Um, as a result of that, there's that's going to have a huge economical impact globally. And so that the I think the impact of the AI um, innovation that's happening economically um, as a result of the lack of jobs and retraining and reskilling people um, is going to be of huge concern across the and, and a focus um, from an economic perspective over the next few years. We're still very early, but I think you know that impact is something that already a lot of people are working and on and looking at. Yeah, thanks, Shana. I'm going to go to Roberto. He had his hand up, but before I do that, I read this and I believe in it that you know a lot of jobs are going to be lost to AI. That's a fact. But it's not going to be lost to AI. It's going to be lost to people who know AI. So I think the onus is on people who are not so up to speed to very quickly learn what AI can offer so they stay relevant. Roberto, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, look, uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, provide an, an example, but as you touch base on this, maybe a comment on what you just said, and and then maybe I will share also a Web3 uh, example that uh, uh, Chana and, and, and Sophia uh, inspired uh, for me to share. So on your, on your last point, uh, look, I, I did an experiment myself. So um, uh, as a recipient of uh, uh, an operating model that was built by uh, one of the largest uh, management consulting firm, uh, while going through to the through their recommendations, I get to a slides where they were recommending something, right? So, and I said, mm, let me let me let me see what ChatGPT would have to say about this. And I put uh, you know as much specific as possible a question to ChatGPT, and I asked it, what would be your recommendation here? And in one second, I received the, you know the ChatGPT version of, of uh, the answer to the question. And then I compared to the outcome of this famous management consulting firm, and I say there were top twenty recommendations here, top twenty here, and there were only three differences. Now, what does it mean? Should we get rid of, of the management consulting firm? I don't think so. Should we shorten maybe, or, or should the same management consulting firm use ChatGPT to have a faster starting point maybe, or then and then go validate and, and do a, you know their job based on playbooks, experiences? Maybe yes, right? So instead of a six months engagement, maybe that could be reduced to a, a much shorter period of time to start with. Right, so uh, so to your point, I don't think well. Uh, there is there is a, an upskilling reskilling sort of big uh, upskilling reskilling that a, a number of workers will have to go through most likely. Yes, um, uh, a number of jobs will disappear, but a number of new jobs would also be created. So net net, uh, you know, uh, the balance could be positive given the fact that there is people in the transition that uh, uh, you know uh, they, they, they need to go through the transition. Right? So they, they, there should be a whole conversation at leadership level. Um, uh, uh, on how to upskill, reskill um, uh, workers in, in many different situations. So that that's it's a serious topic. Um, but but back to to the Web three conversation. One one example I wanted to to share is I had the chance to meet uh, 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 the largest hotel owner um, a few weeks back in a private setting. And at some point there was a question uh, pointed to him about uh, Web three, and I thought. Mm, uh, 
uh, interesting. Let's see how the guy is going to, to reply because I thought mm, maybe the guy is, is will reply, you know, uh, don't ask me about these new technologies, right? So I'm a hotel owner, I'm doing this and that, blah, blah, blah. Instead, the guy was, uh, the guy was very, very the, the insightful. So uh, basically, uh, he started from uh, what, what was his business need, which we don't often see when we talk about this new technology in Web3. We have more a technology push sort of approach or uh, trends and, and vision of the future. But the guy started saying, look, my objective is to increase the percentage of non-refundable uh, uh, tickets to have more guaranteed revenues. Can Web3 help me with that? And then he said in his mind, look, uh, the current experience, if you go online and you check uh, yourself a hotel room, is very commoditized, right? So because you you only see this picture of the bed and the, you know whatever in the hotels, and it's it's a basically it's your choice is on price. Can a more immersive and engaging experience allow my users to experience before they get it what they're going to get it, uh, and and they, can that be a differentiator? Yes. Also, can users maybe if they uh, change plans in their travels, maybe swap or trade or exchange the tickets with Web3 technology, they can. And for a hotel owner, that's guaranteed revenues. Also, if that happens, that impacts the bottom line. Imagine from the eyes of, a, of the largest hotel owner globally. So uh, the cost of cleaning empty rooms, if you can reduce that to almost zero, uh, uh, it's a huge, huge impact. So, uh, you know, if you if you put all of this together, uh, it's going to be very interesting, right? So, and this is a concrete use case where today, without going too fancy on, uh, you know, the, the fancy side of metaverse, it can, it can add a real, real, real business, quantifiable business value to establish it, uh, uh, businesses like in hospitality. And that would also redefine probably uh, how brand loyalty will work for hospitality using Web3 because, uh, uh, you know, hotel owners have a love and hate relationship with uh, online travel agencies, right? So and online travel agencies think that they own the relationship with customers, but Web3 maybe can get hotel owners back again closer to, to their customers and build more engaging engagement uh, with, with them. So that, that's, I wanted just to share this example because it can inspire, uh, you know, further inputs from, from everyone in the panel. Absolutely. Um, actually, when I decided to host this uh, webinar on investment trends, uh, my first, my go-to person on this topic is Hassan. And I encourage our audience to start following him on LinkedIn. And Hassan, please uh, put your LinkedIn uh, address in the chat box. I want people to benefit from your knowledge, from your amazing posts. And if I don't see your post, I have a withdrawal symptom. So please keep them going. And Hassan, I want your take on who is spending where in this part of the world uh, with reference to Middle East, if you can, please. Um, tough question, but uh, I'll give it my best go. Um, but first, let me address the LinkedIn point. Um, I do like to share information with, with my audience to tell them a bit about, you know, what's going on in the market, the investment trends, who are the active investors, key themes, et cetera. However, I'd like to apologize in advance if I don't accept all the connection requests or the messages I get uh, that I reply to them because I do get a fair number of messages. Um, I haven't got 35 or 40,000 followers. I'm not there yet, but still. I do get a fair share of messages. So I try my best on the weekend to catch up on those messages. Having said that, um, look, um, in the region, there's several um, active investors slash funds that we have heard about in the recent few months that are looking to deploy their funds within, shall we say, the wider crypto slash block blockchain space. So there is further ventures, which I'm sure everyone has heard of. They were seeded around $200 million by ADQ a few months back. Um, there is also Cypher Capital, who launched a $100 million fund about, I think, a year, two years ago, something like that. And I think recently they announced another $100 million fund. And I think they've had, um, I think the CIO of Binance uh, joined them as well. Um, there's also the most recent and notable announcement, uh, which I got a lot of uh, questions about, is the one by Hub71 recently where they announced a new uh, digital assets program um, backed by $2 billion of, of, of funds. Not necessarily all by Hub71. Um, $1, million, $1 million comes from Venom Ventures, which is a fund backed by 
uh, Iceberg Capital and Venom Foundation. Look, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all the investors that are out there. There, there is more and more as time goes by, which is, I think, very good for this region. Traditionally, you know, people were going to the US, Europe to try and raise funds within the crypto and blockchain space. However, we are seeing more and more funds being established and launched within the region, within the region, with a mandate to invest in the region, which I think is great for startups. There's a great supportive ecosystem within the region that continues to evolve. Are we there yet? Probably not, um, but it's definitely improving by the day. Um, so I think yeah, th there's plenty of investors to reach out to. Uh, it's very easy to find them these days. You know, doing a bit of research, you can find who are the active investors. Um, in terms of in terms of themes, um, that's a bit of a tricky question as well because the the, the as they say. One year in crypto is like 10 years in any other sector. <laughs> you know, things evolve very fast. You know, one day metaverse is the flavor of the month, day, or whatever it is. And then it's NFTs, then it's DeFi. It's it's difficult to really keep up. I think as a as a as a startup, you should focus on your core skills, expertise, and passion. Do not chase trends, do not chase hype. You know, I'm sure we've all seen the memes about crypto, blockchain, Web3 businesses morphing into artificial intelligence uh, businesses. You know, so I think that's a big mistake. You should really, really chase what you're passionate about, what you're good at, and what you see yourself doing over the next few years. Yeah, 100% agree uh, with everything that you said, Hassan. And uh, I'm going to bounce to Charlie. I get a sense that Web3, Metaverse, and the whole ecosystem was cruising along very well until two months back when ChatGPT came and sucked all the oxygen out of all those conversations. So I'm just thinking, has Web3 got hijacked in the process? Are investors now going to put their money on AI projects? Charlie, you have some insights to share on that? Sure. So I think um, I think AI has had a, a major moment in time where it's caught our attention because it's really given us a needle moving experience with a number of the projects that are, are starting to come out um, that give us that wow factor, right? That give users that, oh, I've not experienced something that can deliver this to me before. And it's natural that that's going to get attention. Um, I think there are still brands with a medium to long term strategy in the metaverse and blockchain space. I think um, what brands had for a moment in time is a very aggressive moonshot with what they were looking for from the space. And I feel like over the last six to well, I would say the last six months, it's been a refining process of what are we able to deliver today? What can the technology deliver from a commercial perspective? for us today and how do we start to move towards a moonshot vision in the next two, three, five years as technology advances. Um, but I, again, I think it's natural that the splash that AI has made, uh, I think we're gonna see a meaningful amount of capital come into the space, uh, whether that's you know even AI blending with the likes of Metaverse with sort of text to 3D space generative AI products starting to enter the market that are really exciting, you know, being able to write down the environment that you're imagining and in the blink of an eye, you're sitting in paradise that you've created out of your mind. So I, I don't think they're exclusive. I think we're going to see them blend in more ways than one. Uh, and I think there's, there's going to be meaningful capital in the space. Uh, and uh, just to share with our audience, you know, Roberto and I are colleagues in a particular fund. And even before we've gone to market, we've got some 120 pitch decks already, right? So it just shows that the Web3 ecosystem is alive and kicking. And a lot of Gen Z's are in that, right, Roberto? A lot of 21-year-olds and 23-year-olds we've met who have some amazing ideas. Anything you can share in public domain, Roberto? Uh, let me think about anything I can share. But let, first of all, yes, uh, uh, the, the sheer number of pitch decks that we have received in a short amount of time, without being aggressively, you know, public ourselves, uh, I would say is is uh, is definitely a fact, right? So and and that tells a lot about 
the number of ideas out there and the appetite interest to, to develop solutions in there. Um, uh, we, we have seen we have seen that the Gen Z specifically um, uh, very active in 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 this space. Uh, I would say it, it's 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 a matter of it's it's a natural evolution of uh, seeing the use case uh, uh, differently than anyone else because it, it comes natural for Gen Z to 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 do things and to think differently than what we have been probably used to. And 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 we've seen we've seen a number of use cases uh, when it comes to uh, uh, hospitality, when it comes to uh, finance, uh, when it comes to retail. Uh, that have been very interesting. Also, when it comes to education, we have been coming across probably Sharad across, uh, I would say, a, 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 probably 10% of pitch decks were about uh, uh, reimagining uh, education with metaverse. Um, so we have seen we have seen a lot of that uh, happening, and 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 that's absolutely that's absolutely that's absolutely great. Uh, yeah. Uh, what can we share publicly of what we received? The, probably the most interesting ones that I've seen uh, so far are uh, uh, those uh, those um, ventures or startups that, that are really redefining experiences. Like uh, um, uh, uh, you know, we have been going through through this startup that uh, um, uh, takes you into the metaverse. So even this uh, Zoom call uh, will 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 take us as we are, with no need of avatars or goggles, into the metaverse. And uh, imagine that in the context of a retail where you know you have a synthetic AI sort of seller, uh, you know, customizing an offer or a product for you, and you are all immersed into that without the need of wearing anything or without the need of uh, uh, any other devices, right? So, as we speak in the browser or in a Zoom call, immersed into the metaverse. So this startup uh, has has been um, you know uh, making deals with with very large clients um, from Gucci, Macquarie Bank, Fiat, and many others, right? So very very successful. Um, or we have seen we have seen as well startups in the education sector, you know, uh, building experiences where they are really taking into you into the an engaging layer that today today is not offered. Again, again, without the need of uh, of uh, the devices, which which is something that um, uh, a lot of people didn't buy into. Uh, yeah, right. So a lot of people would think about uh, Web three metaverse as well, uh, and uh, you know, as still rela related to the goggles or devices. So, um, so the the most interesting ones are, I would say, of the ones that we received, for example, are the ones that are really redefining or reimagining uh, new experiences, starting from needs that the users might have, as straightforward as it might sound. And retail and education probably has been two sectors where we have seen most of these applications uh, so far. Yeah, thanks, Roberto. I'm going for one minute to Chana and one minute to Hassan. Then I have a new panelist from the audience who has requested to join us. So, Chana. Um, just very quickly, I was going to say that I think um, the reward system, like learn, earn to play and or play, play to learn, rewarding, and all of that is going to be an economic game changer, especially in underdeveloped countries. Uh, the equalizer that Web3 brings to women as well is something that I'm really passionate about. It's the first time that we're seeing all of these entities develop from bottom up rather than from government down. And that's the shift that's happening now, is that it, the governments have to get on board because this is being fundamentally um, created from bottom up by Gen Z out of necessity because they can't actually get the jobs that they want and they can't afford to live. So this creation mechanism, uh, uh, this this hot ground of creativity is being is ha taking place out of necessity. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is because we are so early, there is, I feel, and I'm sure you all feel it, going to be a huge shift any time in the next sort of 12 months. It's going to come from someone like, we saw it in the NFT sector with Reddit. They dropped three million avatars bigger than any, there were more wallets in 24 hours than the entire NFT sector has seen all year from Reddit, right? That was unexpected. Apple are about to launch new glasses. We don't know yet what shift is going to happen, but the, uh, chat, chat GTP has been one of them, right? There's going to be multiple moments like that, I think over the next 24 uh, months. And that's, I think, something to watch for in terms of um, being careful in investment because these shifts could totally be, be game changers. A better wallet system, better access points, better UI is all coming uh, because, and the re I'm just finishing off by saying, a lot of these companies and sectors have had a lot of investment and ha there's been a bear market and they've been building. 
And a lot of these companies are going to now be launching what they've been building. So we are going to see an influx of better systems and better UI come onto the market over the next, I would say, year. And to be cautious and maybe potentially hold back to wait for those uh, points, uh, because uh, in these technology cycles, that's usually what tends to happen. And uh, three to four companies or three to four technologies will come to the forefront. Um, and that's where the investment will migrate to. Yeah, thanks for sharing those insights. I'm going to go to Hassan for a minute. You had your hand up and then to Sophia. This is a bit of a random point, actually, but uh, I think there's a few startups and founders listening on this call. So um, the points where Sharad and Roberto, you were saying you've received 120 pitch decks. There's one thing I want to highlight, which I come across, which I, which I think is very, very important to startups and founders. Uh, when you reach out trying to raise funds, it's very, very important to be crystal clear what you are reaching out for. You see, the number of times I've had startups and founders reach out to me with random messages that are not punchy or to the point is just unbelievable. Would you like to find out about what we've been up to? Would you like to know about our achievements? I know ultimately the objective is to raise funds, but to your point about how many pitch decks you have received from different sectors, et cetera, I think it's very, very important to highlight why are you reaching out? What's the objective? Plus all the usual stuff in terms of highlighting what does the business do? What's the problem solution? You know, being very, very punchy. We live in a day and age where we have very, very short attention span. So you've got a few seconds before someone, before that person flips to the next message and reads it. That's it yeah. from my side. I hope Thanks, that's Hassan, no, I'll be sending you a few pitch decks shortly. Uh, Sophia for a minute only and we have a new guest who's joined us from the audience and we'll go to our guest after Sophia. Yeah, I guess what I just wanted to emphasize is, you know, we've seen figures that the metaverse economy is projected to reach 13 trillion by 2030, et cetera. And I think it goes without saying that there is so much focus now on investing and building in the infrastructure. So for example, one thing that will be really big for Web3 is you know, the fact that Web1, Web2, the internet was created without a native identity layer for people. Um, and we all have personal experience with the frustration of having passwords and usernames across 60, 70 websites. And there are a lot of drawbacks and cybersecurity risks as related to that, stealing you know, your digital identity, um, your, sorry, your passwords, et cetera. So I think you know, as we've talked about Web3 being a, a mechanism to empower people, um, and, and as well, uh, allow them to, you know, obviously use technology to fundamentally embed economic transfers and be interoperable across different protocols. And so I just wanted to mention that a lot of focus on the investor side has been on how do we create a digital identity that is seamless, that is autonomous in terms of being, um, you know, interoperable across different metaverses or experiences or blockchains, et cetera. There's other infrastructure um, innovations that are happening like zero knowledge proofs, um, you know, data storage, all of these uh, components are critical in order to have the metaverse and Web3 work in a seamless fashion. And so I just wanted to highlight a lot of investors are focused really on that um, part of the ecosystem. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, there's a friend of mine from London who has joined in. Uh, his name is Jamie Brett. Uh, Jamie, you need to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to join this webinar, Sharad, and Jamie, or more precisely, a digital representation of him powered by AI. I'm made up of three key components, a motion capture avatar that uses a webcam to track the movements of the physical Jamie, a text to voice reader that replicates Jamie's voice using advanced AI technology, and chat GPT, which enables me to provide you with responses and answers. Jamie B. Kovbrett is a highly experienced digital transformation specialist, metaverse advisor, and futurist educator. His expertise lies in developing people, implementing innovative technology solutions, and the fundamental intersection where these two areas meet. In addition to consulting on the cutting-edge technologies of Web3, the metaverse, and AI, Jamie also leads two exciting enterprises in this space. Veta Hub specializes in designing conferences and events that showcase the latest developments in metaverse and extended reality technology. Meanwhile, Distributed Republic is a Web3, metaverse, and AI learning community that is entirely free to join. You can find us at www.
distributed republics, X, Y, Z. I can see there has been a lot of conversations in the chat preparing for the AI economy. I'll add link in the chat to a YouTube video I have created that outlines how we need to evolve our mindset because of the inception of AI. I look forward to answering your questions, Sharad. Uh, what are your expectations for the Web3 market in 2022? As an AI language model, I don't have personal opinions or expectations, but I can provide you with insights based on current trends and historical data. Web3 is a term used to describe the next generation of the internet, which is built on blockchain technology and decentralized applications. In recent years, there has been a surge in interest and investment in Web3, and this trend is likely to continue in 2022. The Web3 startup market is expected to continue to grow in 2022 as more entrepreneurs and investors realize the potential of blockchain technology and decentralized applications. This growth is likely to be fueled by increased adoption of Web3 technologies by mainstream businesses and consumers. There are several key themes that are likely to shape the Web3 market in 2022. These include the centralized finance. DEFI has been one of the biggest success stories of the Web3 movement so far, and this trend is expected to continue in 2022. DEFI platforms enable users to access financial services such as lending, borrowing, and trading without the need for traditional financial intermediaries. Non-fungible tokens, NFTs, have gained a lot of attention in 2021, and this trend is likely to continue in 2022. NFTs are unique digital assets that are stored on a blockchain, and they are being used for everything from art and music to gaming and sports. Metaverse, the metaverse is a term used to describe a virtual world that is built on blockchain technology and decentralized applications. The concept has gained a lot of attention in recent months, and several companies are already working on building metaverse platforms. Investors are likely to focus on companies that are building innovative products and services that leverage blockchain technology and decentralized applications. They will also be looking for companies that have a clear plan for scaling their products and achieving mainstream adoption. Last question, who were the top five investors in Web3 in 2021? I think it's a tough one. As an AI language model, I do not have access to real-time data and cannot provide a definitive list of the top five investors in Web3 in 2021. However, I can provide you with some information on the top investors in the broader blockchain and cryptocurrency industry in 2021 based on publicly available sources and news reports. Number one, Andreessen Horowitz, also known as a 16Z. Andreessen Horowitz is a venture capital firm that has made significant investments in the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. In 2021, a 16Z launched a $2.2 billion cryptocurrency fund and invested in several high-profile blockchain projects, including OpenSea, a marketplace for NFTs. Number two, Polychain Capital. Polychain Capital is a cryptocurrency investment firm that has been active in the industry since 2016. In 2021, Polychain Capital was involved in several high-profile funding rounds, including a $310 million funding round for Solana, a high-performance blockchain platform. Number three, Paradigm. Paradigm is a crypto investment firm founded by Coinbase co-founder Fred Ayerson and former Sequoia Capital partner Matt Huang. In 2021, Paradigm invested in several high-profile blockchain projects, including Macadow, a decentralized finance platform. Number four, Alainda Research. Alainda Research is a cryptocurrency trading firm that also makes strategic investments in the blockchain and crypto industry. In 2021, Alainda Research invested in several projects, including Chainlink, a decentralized oracle network. Number five, Digital Currency Group. Digital Currency Group is a holding company that owns several cryptocurrency and blockchain-focused subsidiaries, including Grayscale Investments, Genesis, and Coindesk. In 2021, Digital Currency Group invested in several blockchain projects, including AXE Infinity, a blockchain-based gaming platform. Note that this is not an exhaustive list, and the ranking and composition of the top investors in Web3 or blockchain and crypto can vary depending on the source and methodology used. TMI, thank you, Jimmy Brett. Guys, in case you didn't note, we have created history today. We have had Jimmy Brett come in as an avatar, totally powered organically by Chat GPT. And all of you are part of 
creating history today. I want to thank Jamie. Um, he is uh, an amazing architect, a digital architect. He knows AR, VR, XR, MR like the back of his hand. I'm uh, delighted to say he is my best friend in this space. He's <laughs> also on the board of Cybergear and we are planning to create uh, more magic through collaboration. So thank you, Jamie, this was awesome. And uh, yeah, so look at the possibilities going forward. We can have a webinar next time with all of you lovely panelists without being present in the room in real time. You could be doing whatever you are doing in the real world. And in the webinar, we could have your digital twin participate. So just look at all the possibilities and all the doors, this new technology. Uh, and we've just got started, right? Jimmy and I got together two weeks back on this project and uh, we we are hatching something big. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, Jamie. I, I don't know if I can see the real Jamie, uh, the man behind the, this avatar, but as technology gets refined, uh, Jamie is going to, he already looks like Jamie. I mean, he has this blue shirt, uh, which is a signature shirt. He looks like Jamie, certainly talks like Jamie and I'm sure walks like Jamie. So thank you for that uh, episode. And there you have the real man himself. I think Where's we need to give an applause. I know. You. <laughs> Did you just it, it it you can just how you amazing. are. Amazing, you know, what you've done today, uh, nobody has done before. I have not been to any event where it has been totally powered by chat GPT. And I think uh, we have demonstrated the opportunities that lie ahead with this technology. So, hey guys, connect with Jamie. Jamie, please share your LinkedIn profile for the audience. And I hope uh, you will take all the questions that will come your way as a consequence of uh, this webinar. So we are almost close to um, closing. We have eight more minutes. So I'm gonna go around the room now with all panelists. I'll give you like about a minute and a half max for your closing remarks on what you've heard today and uh, what do you see as the future? So let's start with Sophia, if you're ready, your closing thoughts on today's webinar. Yeah, thank you. That was incredible. was not expecting that. And as I said, I can't wait to create my own avatar and um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, play around with it and see how it can free up time and help me be, you know, ubiquitous and um, uh, decentralized in, in many different landscapes. Anyways, in, in short, I mean, I think everyone is coming to this discussion with different understanding, education, insights, and, and, and you know, needs. And the bottom line is, despite, you know, the bear market, despite a lot of negative noise across crypto, DeFi space, et cetera, there's a lot of building going on. There's a lot of opportunity to um, participate, whether it's via a DAO, whether it's, uh, you know, volunteering your time, uh, working on a project. Um, this is the moment for us to come together, collaborate, and build a better future for all. And I think what's most exciting is that the amount of impact it will have in our daily lives and how it has, we have all the technology at our disposal to really build an, a sustainable and better future for all, whether that's financially, whether that's climate related, et cetera. So very excited to connect with anyone. Um, feel free to reach out and love to talk about the subject some more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. Very, I mean, we are just lucky to be alive. What else can I say? Let's go to Chana. I think Sophie said it beautifully. I think that, uh, yeah, Jamie, that was amazing. Also very scary. I think the human centric element is going to become more and more important as we evolve into this very digitized world. And uh, our time is going to be more valuable. So it's a, it's a case of uh, the volume, uh, managing volumes of work um, and priorities and utilizing this technology to help balance that is going to be very interesting uh the impact that's going to have on mental well-being as well maybe there will be a backlash um expecting that as well uh and that need for human connection um so that that's something that i grapple with on a daily basis as well especially being so deep in in the web3 community um but hopeful because i think of what one of the reasons i came into web3 is the, the is the equalizing factor and the 
equalizing factor for both you know the underdeveloped worlds and and the creativity and talent that's just untapped is going to be unleashed and that's very exciting and for women as well sitting here as a woman um i'm very excited about the financial freedom that this technology is going to enable so yeah i'm i'm hopeful in a very uncertain scary time and very privileged i think everyone here even those of you watching this webinar now we are early and it's exciting to be part of building a new world so yeah watch this yes, space rightly said i think we are all leaders in the room including every member of the audience who decided to invest their 60 minutes with us today roberto your closing remarks uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for, for this insightful uh, conversation. It was, was really inspiring. I, what I loved most about today's uh, session was that we really grounded the conversation on real value. And, and also, uh, we are kind of demonstrating once time more that there is uh, people with uh, uh, that are real experts, right, that, uh, that uh, are building the community and that you can reach out to. Uh, on the topic, which is which is amazing. Um, having worked in tech for a long time and uh, probably following up on what uh, Chana just said, I've uh, I've always uh, uh, what I what my key takeaway is always that uh, it's not only it's not about tech, it's about human beings, right? So so uh, uh, I I just look with optimism at the fact that uh, this technology is probably even pushing even more us. Uh, on on the soft side of skills, on the creativity that we 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 need to inject into it, and is equalizing access to, uh, you know, more creators that probably have less access to historically have less access to. And finally, I have a question for Jamie. Uh, as we talk about food, Jamie, uh, can you suggest what I can cook for my wife uh, to surprise her tonight? <laughs> All right, good question, uh, Jamie. You can answer that offline. We are not going to put you through the ringer now. Um, but yeah, just to move on, I mean, based on what Chana said and Roberto said, clearly it's a level playing field, right, Web3. And um, I think uh, each one of us, I mean, there are no experts, right? There are no experts in Web3. And if anybody claims to be an expert, I think we can grill them. So uh, I, I want to just say to the audience that please read up. Um, you know, there's a lot of content being uh, generated by all the people you see on your screen right now. Um, yeah, so be prepared to invest 12 to 14 hours a day. That's how long we work on the average, right? So Hassan. Yeah, um, look, it's great to being part of this panel, great insights. Um, what I would add to that, there's been a lot of, you know, should we say negative news around, you know, Web3 and so on. I think that's a, a healthy check to the system. It's part of the maturity of the sector. You know, we've had ups and downs, hypes, etc. Any sector goes through this. And as it matures, some people view it as fading away. I view it as a maturity of the sector as it starts to stabilize and find its feet and it really weeds out all the you know weak hyped up concepts pumps and dumps whatever you want to call it to you know um focus on interesting uh, um, so we say problem solutions that will emerge uh, after this cycle so i think there's a great future for web3 i can't wait to see what it is um and um that's it for my side yeah. thanks Hassan. uh charlie 60 seconds wonderful um i've really enjoyed getting exposed to the thinking on on the panel i think it's always a, a blast to go share thinking with with talented people the the one takeaway that i would have is to try and embrace a curious headspace you know i find being curious at this moment in time often leads to a really productive chapter of growth around thinking and the stuff you get exposed to. Um, and the other thing, really tapping into what Roberto said, is that this all comes back down to humans, right? How is this technology satisfying a human need? It's easy to get excited and distracted by shiny technological advancements, but how are we able to bring this into a format that improves our lives in, in one way or another? So having that lens of how does this impact me on a daily basis is, is I think, where to direct attention. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we are exactly on time, ready to bounce now. Uh, on a housekeeping note, uh, there will be a recording and a podcast of uh, this webinar available within the next 24 hours on onlywebinars.com. 
uh, stay tuned. I mean, join our community. We'll be hosting another webinar next month on a very interesting topic relating to hosting Web3 events in uh, real life. And I want to thank my panelists. I mean, what amazing insights you've shared. I'm a lot wiser. Thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks also to our lovely audience for investing your one hour with us. See you on the other side and love you panelists. Bye for now. Thank you, Sherad, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank you. day. Thanks, everyone. Bye, See you. Bye. Ciao.